Oh, okay. I hope they got some gas in South Carolina before they went up. The gas went up, didn't it? The uh, gas prices have gone up. Gas prices going up. I mean, last week they were 319 and now they're 335. <laughs> So, yes, sir. Prayers for them to get home. There you go. Gail's got a couple of horses you can ride. <laughs> we'll pull our money and get a, a cart. Might give you a new one. There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've already offered her to come to the house. She would have none of it. She's going to stay right there with you. Mm-hmm. Trying to get people to come. That's why we're going we're gonna to keep fishing, which is what Jesus is going to uh, tell these boys today. Let's go fishing <laughs> and keep fishing. People are listening. People are paying attention. Just keep fishing. Miss Nell, anything? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, let's pray. We're so thankful to you, Father. We, we love you so much. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you today. I thank you for Sunday. I thank you for what the whole day means and what the whole day uh, gives us, Lord, to come to your house and to rest in you. And we do pray for our nation, for our people, Lord. We lift up our administration, our Congress. We lift up our Supreme Court. We pray, O oh God, that you would direct and guide and give your wisdom, Lord. 
We pray, Father, that uh, folks would want to and have a desire to come to church, Lord. And we just pray, Father, in, in our universe of obligation that we would reach out and continue to invite and to talk of your goodness, Lord, to tell our stories and to give what uh, you've done in our lives, oh God. And we pray for those that are around us and those that we can reach out to, Father. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for the time that you give us to gather today. I pray uh, and, and thank you for the, the liberty to worship you freely, Lord. I thank you, Father, for the lesson today and the upcoming message, the, the song, the music, Lord. And thank you for those in the other building that are teaching children even now those that do the children's church, Lord, I thank you for them, Father. Those that do our youth, oh God, I thank you for them, Father. And we just praise you, Father, for this day and for this hour, the request for those that are going through cancer treatments, those that are uh, facing procedures this upcoming week, Lord, and this um, situation that uh, JB faces, Lord, I pray you just... You promise that you'll be with us when we walk through the waters, Lord, that we won't drown. That when we go through these fires of oppression, Lord, that the flames won't burn us, Lord. That you'll be with us, Father. I thank you for that. Thank you for being with us, Lord. Thank you for your presence. We pray, Lord, for our family members that are lost, that they would come to you. Our family that needs uh, a shaking up, Lord. Uh, a personal revelation of you, I pray for that, oh God. I thank you for how you care for us in spite of our unfaithfulness, that you are always faithful, Lord. We thank you, Father, for uh, this time and this hour, and I thank you for the message that you're about to give us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So you guys, um, we're going to go fishing, okay? So this is uh, Peter and the other disciples. There's six other disciples that they're going to mention, and there may be more that aren't mentioned, that are going to go, they're going to go back to fishing. Because, you know, that's all they know. That's their occupation. They're going to continue doing what they've been doing. Because if you go back to um, ver, uh, chapter 20, it's going to say that Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. Because this is when He had just shown up in the upper room to Thomas, right? When Thomas, you know, Thomas was like, oh, unless I see Him and touch Him, I won't believe. <laughs> you know, all of us doubting Thomases, right? And so uh, then that leads into chapter 21 that says, after these things. So after He had shown up and had been on the earth for 40 days and all the things that he had done, whatever the chronology is, because these disciples have written about it in their Gospels, but whatever the chronology was, Jesus shows up to them uh, at the Sea of Tiberias because he knew that uh, they probably were trying to process everything that was going on. They are probably trying to figure... You know when you go through these huge life changes... And that's what they had gone through, a big life change. He had been crucified, and then he did what he said he was going to do. He showed himself, I mean, he rose from the grave. And he told them he was going to do that, and now he's been walking on the earth, but he shows up when he wants to. Isn't that what he does today? He can show up when he wants to. He can withhold himself when he wants to. He can walk through a wall when he wants to. Um, he can be cooking some fish on the sand when he wants to. And that's where they find him today. Let's start here. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. So you got these guys that are, you know, they've decided to go fishing. But in this way, he showed himself. He decided to show himself 
um, taking care of them. He's cooking for them. Isn't that just like God to show up and feed us <laughs> and give us food? Whatever that food may be, it may be natural provisions that we need to eat. And it may be some spiritual word that we need from him. Or just to know that he's on the sand sitting there and we're out doing our thing, just to know that he's there. And in this way, he showed himself. I think that's beautiful that he showed himself. I mean, but he, he physically showed himself. I tell you what, if Jesus were to step through that wall over there, I don't know what we'd all do. What, what would we do, honestly? Would you run to him? Would you go face down? <laughs> would you be standing there wide-mouthed? <laughs> would you run? <laughs> exactly. Well, Simon Peter, bless his soul, you know, he's, he's the head guy. He just can't help it. If you possess natural leadership skills, you just can't help it. That's just who the guy was. And he apparently is a pretty big guy too, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. But John records these um, different appearances of Jesus. And Matthew 28, 16 tells us uh, the same thing. The eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had, a, which Jesus had appointed for them. So the Sea of Tiberias was there in Galilee, and uh, so we see that in in Matthew, the Matthew uh, Gospel as well. So um, I noticed that uh, when he lists these disciples again, Simon Peter was listed first. It's that leadership capability that God gives um, certain folks are leaders and certain folks are followers and, you know, that type of thing. And you guys know, you know, within yourself which, which you are. Thomas, Nathaniel, there's those sons of Zebedee, James and John, and two others of his disciples. And before I go to Simon Peter, two others of his disciples, do you notice their names not mentioned? Isn't it nice that these two others probably represent all of us anonymous, unknown people <laughs> who prefer, I don't know about y'all, I prefer to be obscure. I don't want to be known, actually. Um, anytime I'm out and about in the community and um, I was talking to somebody in, in uh, either Walmart or Food Line, because I, I either go to church, Walmart, or Food Line, or school. You, you can track me very easily on your GPS. And uh, somebody said, well, aren't you the preacher's wife? And I said, oh, don't tell it, don't tell it. <laughs> yeah, because everybody does this weird changing thing in the group, and I don't want that to happen. I just want to be married. <laughs> Say it again. Uh, why? Because what? You know, and um, I, I just don't want to be known. Anyway, these people, hidden multitudes of, of souls, all throughout how many thousands of years since he's come. Think about all the people that God knows what they've been doing and how they've been. The little old, you know, soul that's just praying in their house. They can't get out, can't go anywhere. They got, you know, difficulties maybe physically. And that sweet little old soul, whoever it may be, male or female, you don't have to say, you know, whatever. They're just praying. Nobody will ever know their name, you know, never know their name. Or the person that led somebody to the Lord who that somebody became real famous. You know what I'm saying? Like the Billy Grahams and the, all the people that became famous, the person that led them to the Lord, right? Or all the millions of mamas and grandmas and grandpas and dads that have poured Jesus into their children. And their children became something, you know, famous or whatever. So I think about that. Y'all ever listen to um, Denzel Washington's testimony? Oh, his mom and his grandma. Oh, he's got a fabulous testimony. I show it to my seniors right before they graduate. And he's doing a graduation address. And he talks, his mama uh, did hair. He grew up in the salon with a bunch of old women who was just pouring into him. He's got a fabulous testimony. Anyway, go Google that. It's on YouTube. <laughs> anyway, 
So um, these, these thousands of other, millions of other people, but here it says there were two of these disciples, never gave us our name or their name. And all of a sudden, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Now, why would Peter want to go fishing? First of all, they were probably a little stir crazy, but they wanted to go back to, and it may be, now think about this, and one of the old commentators named Adam Clark, he was also into the, in the 1800s, for those of you that like Spurgeon. Adam Clark, C-L-A-R-K-E, also has some good commentaries. He said, you know, that um, there's a possibility, do you know, you know, whenever Jesus was traveling around the areas and going from town to town, there were people who supported him, who gave money to support while they traveled. And it's, of course, now that Jesus is gone, they may have lost their base of support financially. And it may be Peter needed, they needed some money. They needed to go back to work because their base of, of support had gone away now that Jesus had died. And so, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to my former uh, occupation and uh, I'm going to go fishing. Other commentators believe that uh, it was his um, safety place. It's what he knew was, you know, comfortable. And he knew he could, it's like when a preacher gets on the lawnmower. He just gets on that lawnmower. And he, he'll go over places he's already mowed. <laughs> he, just, he says he gets his best sermons on the lawnmower. Yeah, it's crazy. So it may just be that place that you go to. And for Peter, that may... And these other guys, of course, were fishermen. James and John, we know they were too. And uh, it was practical. It was uh, simple. And he knew what to do. It was a safe place, right? Okay. So um, let's see what the rest of them says. They said to him, we're going to go with you too. And they went out and immediately got into the boat. And now fishing, they're going to be fishing, you know, throughout the night. And that night they caught nothing. So Peter and these uh, disciples, maybe uncertain of what to do, maybe they needed their safe place, maybe they needed money. Whatever their case was, they went fishing. And they went out all night and they caught nothing. Now the Lord of the sea was sitting on the sand that morning. And you best know it, that He made sure of what? You don't think God's sovereign? He made sure they caught nothing. Right? Go ahead. You know what I'm saying? He can make the fish go wherever they wanted to go. He tells those big old, what are they, blue whales, beluga whales? I mean, them big old whales, orca things. They ain't catching fish. He made all the fish go bed on the other side. <laughs> Not at that point. Because Jesus had something to tell them. He's sovereign over everything. He, you know, the poor old Joseph, I just go to Joseph so often because he gives me such comfort. Poor old Joseph, 20 years worth, y'all. 20 years of praying and asking God to deliver him. And he went from, you know, that pit and then the 20 years and he's, you know, sold and then with, with everything that happened with... Um, um, Oh, what was his name's wife? Potiphar, thank you. I had a P in my head, but I couldn't get the rest of it. Thank you so much. Everything that was going on with Potiphar and Potiphar's wife goes to jail. And then, you know, that the baker and the um, uh, butler got put in there. And he, you know, uh, he's, he's still clinging on to God because, um, and we, we can tell that because he asked God to interpret their dreams. God gives him the interpretation. He says, remember me when you get out. And they're out for two years, and guess what? Guess what God does to their memory, just like He does with this fish? Not going to remember it. Not to the right time. Not to the ex... God's calendar. God's calendar. God's calendar. So if you're sitting here waiting on something, God's calendar. It's going to happen. You've been praying for it. He'll say yes, no, and you know he may ch modify that thing and change it up to what his will is, but God's calendar. So God's calendar uh, was for this particular time that uh, they fished all that night and caught nothing. All right, go to verse 4. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Now he can, 
He can cover his appearance. He can, you know, the guys on the road to Emmaus when we did them, they didn't know until Jesus broke that bread. So they did not know that it was Jesus. And he's just, Jesus is on that shore directing everything. All that was written in books before the foundation of the earth. That's what amazes me. It's already been written. It's already been decided that you would have a procedure next week. It's just been decided. And we can rest in that thing, draw comfort from that thing. And these guys, and I tell you, um, Spurgeon, to be a fisherman, a man must expect disappointments. He must often cast in the net and bring up nothing but weeds. The minister of Christ must reckon upon being disappointed as well. And he must not be weary and well-doing for all the disappointments, but must in faith continue in prayer and labor, expecting that at the end he shall receive his reward. So keep fishing. Keep casting your nets. Jesus is in charge of the work. You know, Keep planting those seeds. And let those seeds do the work that they've been directed to do. What does God say about His Word? It will not come back void. It's going to go in there. It's going to happen. <laughs> I told those seniors Friday, because <clears throat> we were talking about uh, Karl Marx, and y'all know that's communism, right? And we were talking about Adam Smith, which is the uh, capitalistic society that you and I live in. So I have to teach them the differences between capitalism, socialism, and communism. And so we were talking about how uh, some of the things that uh, this guy believed and some of the things this guy believed, and it was completely wrong. I, and I said, y'all ever done anything wrong or ever wrote anything wrong or ever, you know, uh, they raise your hand. And I said, you know what, I have too. And I said, but he is faithful and just. And I just threw First John 1, 9 out there <laughs> to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And occasionally those little guys will say amen. I'll get an amen every once in a while from a couple of them. Amen. <laughs> So just keep throwing those seeds out there. It's amazing. Somebody caught that out of those 32 who, youngins who think they're grown, but they're not. Fixing to graduate. Well, most of them are fixing to graduate. <laughs> anyway. before So he's directing their work. He's directing their work. He's directing everything. And so, let's go. Verse 4. But when the morning had now come, you know they were tired, y'all. They'd been up all night. They'd been toiling and working. Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples didn't know it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? And they answered him, No. Now children there can be translated as lads. Hey, young men. Young men, y'all got any food? He could have been, you know, a guy that they thought was on the shore that maybe was wanting to buy a few of their fish. Not unusual. They're fishermen. As they're coming into shore, there's people that are customers, possible customer. And so, you know, they were thinking that possibly uh, this was uh, Jesus. It also can indicate the suddenness of his appearance. Like, <laughs> And so um, he shows up and uh, he's interested in their life. And so then they say no. Let's go to verse uh, 6. And he said to them, now this is what's so fun about this whole thing, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Now commentators and people all over have tried to bring that right side of the boat, left side of the boat. Who knows? And also the fact that when they finally do catch these fish, the amount of fish, the 153, they've tried to put that into some mysterious magical number. Look, what, where they were fishing, they didn't find any fish, and when he told them to cast on that right side, that's when, through he, who he is, because he's God, he's going to direct those fish, whether he whistled or blew or whatever he did, those fish showed up. Mm-hmm, <laughs> it's amazing. So now they cast, and they were uh, not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Now, they're going to start putting two and two together here. <laughs> and they're going to be able to uh, realize that uh, it's going to be, that's Jesus on the shore. They did what they were told to do. 
and uh, they were d divinely guided. And then there's a difference in doing what we want to do. They said they were going to go fishing, and then here they're divinely guided to go fishing, and uh, they went fishing in their own strength, caught nothing. They go fishing in his strength, and they catch 153 fish. And there's, you know, the lesson is there with divine guidance, right? So therefore, this experience here of everything that they're seeing and uh, knowing that he told them to do this, the disciple whom Jesus loved, do y'all know who that is, don't you? That's John. Isn't it funny how he referred to himself as that the whole time? The disciple who Jesus loved. It's like you guys that say, uh, uh, Gail, you or Netta one says, I'm the only one on his refrigerator, you know. <laughs> the disciple whom Jesus loved. Oh, sure. The ones that we have things in common with. Yeah. The ones that we have more, you know, um, things that we have commonalities. Yeah, absolutely. So therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment because he was, you know, working, he was fishing because he had removed it and he plunged into the sea. So he dove in. Good morning, we're in John 21. John 21, verse 7. John 21, 7. Now remember, John had reached the tomb before Peter, right? And he recognized and believed when he saw the empty tomb. And then John here, he also recognizes the identity of this stranger. And he says, it is the Lord. And John knew that anything... That ju the thing that just had happened, those 153 fish, that opened up John's eyes. Only Jesus could make something like that happen. Only that miracle could have come from him. So uh, just because, go ahead. Uh, he had been fishing. He had, he had removed his outer garments. He probably had a loincloth on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just what you're going to work in. And uh, he probably, um, you know, I'm thinking he might not have wanted to get that outer garment wet. <laughs> so he takes it off so he can be doing whatever they do, you know, when they're fishing. Yeah. Well, what's funny, he grabs that outer garment and plunges in and gets wet anyway. <laughs> ah, so when he plunges in, uh, again, John was the first to uh, recognize him, but Peter's going to be the first one to uh, go in or to dive in. Peter's first in devotion. He is. He's just, you know, Peter's one of those guys that he's either all in or he's not. You know what I'm saying? I I'm with you or I'm not. And we can see that from uh, all the things that we've uh, experienced studying any parts of his life. That boat couldn't move quick enough for him, right? He, he thought, I can outswim it. That's a man right there. You know what I'm saying? I can outswim it. So um, he's the, the first one. <clears throat> and so you continue on. It says here that uh, the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dra dragging the net with the fish. And as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. And uh, Simon Peter went up and dragged the, the net to land full of large fish, 153. Now that's where I wanted to tell you, hey, Peter's a man. He drags that net in full of large fish. And it said Peter drug it in. Peter must have been a good-sized fella. <laughs> Especially if he thought he could out-swim the boat, too. So I'm just thinking he was an Olympian athlete of some sort. <laughs> in my little mind that, you know, just that my little romantic mind that I have. Yeah. And so um, he drags this net in. And, uh, you know, he's so excited anyway. And the other disciples are following and, uh, you know, the, the, the tail end of all of this. And uh, as, as, so Jesus invites them to come and eat. 
and you see this fire of coals and the fish that are on it and the bread. Um, you've got a wet Peter. You've got a, a, a wet John. You've got a wet, you know, all these other disciples. And so they're hungry and they're tired. And uh, there's bread. And you know that fish had to smell good. And they'd been up all night and they were hungry. And um, you know, they noticed that uh, Jesus is sitting here. And uh, once again, y'all, what's he doing? The night before his crucifixion, he fed them, right? He broke the bread, passed it around, blessed it. He, he, he blessed the wine, he passed it around, he was blessed. He had fed them and he washed their feet. And then here, what's he doing? He's feeding them. He's a humble servant. Jesus always being a humble servant. Always being the one who's taking care of others. Isn't that amazing? What a great example for us. Bring some of the fish which you have caught. Now, the uh, events that John tells us says that Jesus had food for them before the great catch of fish were brought in. And what they caught was added to the menu, of course. And uh, they had plenty because they had 153 of them. <laughs> and so uh, this, this large fish thing. Now I want to throw this, this at you as to what the old church fathers tried to put magical things to the 153. Okay. Um, Augustine, the old church father Augustine, said that uh, 153 is the sum of numbers 1 to 17. And this catch of fish points toward the number 17, which he thought to be the number of the commandments, which there are ten commandments, added to the sevenfold gifts of the Spirit. I don't know. Just throwing that at you. Some said that uh, the 153 is the added numerical value of the Greek word Peter and the Greek word fish. I don't know. Go figure. Some say that the Hebrew characters of Simon... And Iona, which is what a fish is in Greek, I-O-N-A, is equivalent to 118 plus 35, which means 153. Again, these you know, different uh, ancient writers. Um, the old ancient uh, church father, Jerome, believed that there were 153 different types of fish in the world <laughs> and that this represented a full harvest of the entire world. I like that one better than any of the other ones that I read, if you want to pick one. So I wanted to throw that at you there. All right. So the disciples are going to sit down and they're going to eat breakfast with Jesus. And this is where our lesson ends. But can I just bring in the questions he asked them real quick? In 12 through 14, we're in um, John 21. John 21, Miss Sam. Um, and I'm going to read verse 12 here. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because John says, knowing that it was the Lord. They knew it was him. And uh, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them. And likewise, the fish. So he's feeding them again, the fish and the bread. That reminds me of the little boy that had the little basket of fish and bread. Did you think the same thing, Rosa? I thought, oh, yeah. How sweet it is that he's breaking it and he's, he's giving it to them and uh, he's feeding them. This is the third time that Jesus had showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So this was only the third time that they had seen him and been in his presence. So you know that they're you know, trying to enjoy the moment and they don't want to say too much. We're not told of what their particular conversation is as they were eating but we are told this. Let's look in verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. This is going to hurt Peter's feelings, right? Because Jesus keeps asking him, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you more than these, you know, these folks that are sitting around you. Yes, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Sina, Simon, excuse me, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. 
And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to, it to him the third time. Now, y'all know what the meaning of those three times are, right? He denied him three times. He was giving him a cleansing from that denial. And Peter would realize that later, but he was cleansing him from those three times of denial. And letting him know, look, that's behind us, buddy. I, I understand what was going on. I understand your fear factor. There's a cleansing here. And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. I'm not denying you. I'm loving you. I'm not denying you. I'm loving you. And a third time, I'm not going to deny you. I love you. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. What do you think he was wanting to do? Jesus wanted Peter to regain the identity that he had lost. When we deny Jesus, we lose our identity. And he wanted him to regain that identity. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And so that, that when that happened, he was saying, be a shepherd. Be a shepherd. Be a shepherdess. Be a shepherdess. Be a shepherd, shepherdess, shepherd, shepherd, right? Shepherdess, shepherdess. Tend my sheep. I want that whatever flock I send you, whatever group I put you over, whatever children, bless the Lord, that He gives you. <laughs> difficult or not. Y'all ever had any difficult sheep, excuse me, children? Hallelujah. Y'all know sheep are dumb. <laughs> I mean, they are. They just dumb. They 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 they, they gonna follow that shepherd. I wasn't referring to our children being dumb, or was I? <laughs> Tend your sheep, whatever he's given you, and he might give you other flocks that you're not even aware of yet. That might be on the way. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Tend my sheep. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. And he was talking about how he was going to die. But Peter misunderstood that thing and thought John was going to live forever till Jesus came back. Isn't that funny? You know they were all a little jealous of John. Right? They were all a little jealous of John. Tend my sheep. Jesus was saying, don't you worry about it. He said, what is that to you if I have him live whatever? You do what I told you to do, and I want you to tend my sheep. And so that speaks to my heart, y'all. I promise you. So Jesus showed up. He, he, he let the fish get caught. That's God's calendar, God's timing. He'll put those fish where he wants them when he wants them. And you'll catch them uh, when he wants you to catch them or, or when he wants you to plant the seeds. And then again, he wants us to be shepherds and shepherdess, shepherdesses. And he loves us. He's going to feed us and give us provision. That whole chapter is a fabulous chapter, y'all. Go back and read it in your quiet time or whatever. That's a fabulous chapter. We're going to be shepherds, shepherdesses. Lord, we love you and praise you. Thank you for, thank you for the uh, feeding of Peter and these uh, other disciples, Lord. Thank you for the lessons that are in here. And help us, Lord, to be faithful to what you've given us. Help us to um, keep our eyes on you and to seek you. I thank you for asking us, Lord, have you got any fish? Have you called anything? Help us, Lord, to keep casting our nets. Help us, Lord, to, to be bold. Help us to have the patience to, to, to keep trying, Lord, and to keep putting one foot in front of another, Lord. We love you and we praise you this day in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, go conquer the world.